Hello, in today's episode of The Art Magical, I'm going to talk about why I find magical art inspiring and what type of magical art I find inspiring. So I uh, became interested in art, um, I guess as a teenager really, um, when I first discovered the pre-Raphaelites and loved their vision of the Celtic twilight and all that sort of thing and the Arthurian imagery. Um, and somewhat paradoxically, you also really love the Impressionists and their beautiful landscapes. Um, so I'm just generally fascinated by art, really. Um, and I think one of the reasons that art is so interesting is because it can um, convey us to other states of of awareness kind of thing in that you look at a piece of art and um, you find that the um, you're looking at into a different world into a window on a different world um, and I think that two-dimensional art works better for me because it's it's more like a window into that other world uh, whereas if you think about a statue, um, statues are nice, but um, I particularly like abstract kind of statues, um, rather like, well, not abstract, but the kind of uh, statue that represents something in a non-literal way. So um, let me give you an example. Um, so a uh, sort of a, I mean, the stylized way. So here's a, uh, one of those little lucky cat statues. So obviously it doesn't really look like a real cat, um, but it's, um, it's also very dusty. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> it, uh, it looks like, uh, we know it's a cat, um, but it's a symbolic representation of a cat rather than a literal shape of a cat. Um, so that's a nice thing. Um, and I think that when you're going for, say, deity statues, my personal preference is to have something that doesn't look as human, maybe. Um, and I especially dislike those sort of hypersexualized representations of deities. I think those are um, not helpful, <laughs> at least not to me. Um, you know, not that we think sex is bad, but like nobody's actually got a, a 12 inch waist and a, um, a giant double F size bust to go with it. So like, you know, and also if you're wearing armor, the best thing to do with armor is to make sure that it actually stops you getting injuries. Um, and most of the armor that uh, these kind of beings are represented wearing um, would not actually work in a real battle so it's silly um, so anyway I I prefer um, for my magical art I prefer something that um, represents a so yeah the kind of deity art that I like is the kind of art that um, represents the, the qualities of the deity rather than um, being a literal representation of them necessarily. Um, just my personal taste. Um, and I think that um, we, you know, if I have something on my altar, then I want it, I'd actually rather it was a two dimensional picture so that it's a window on the world of the deity. Um, however, it's interesting because you know, there are certain religions that think that um, yeah, having statues is idolatry and that we're actually worshipping the statue. Well, that's not the case, obviously. Um, what we're doing is drawing down the essence of the deity into the statue, um, obviously only a small part of the essence, and then we're using it as a focus to focus our mind on the deity. Um, so it's not like you're actually literally worshipping the statue. You're using the statue as a, a focus for your devotion that then is going beyond the statue uh, or the picture or whatever it is to the entity you're focusing on. Um, yeah. 
same with I don't know icons or devotional pictures of saints or whatever um the idea is to focus your attention beyond the image so um yeah don't know why people find that difficult to understand but there you go uh, so um I think it's also worth noting that art doesn't exist in a political vacuum um you know I I went to the art gallery in Ottawa some years ago and I walked into a room where there was a very vivid painting of a lynching and I saw that and I just burst into tears immediately because I you know I kind of took it all in because it was at the other side of the room and I saw that and I was like it was just so shocking that I just burst into tears um and so you know obviously distressing and it's interesting because you know you see photographs of lynchings and they are distressing but they're not usually full size and I think that's why I burst into tears on seeing this painting so art can be very very powerful is my point also um but all art has a political dimension I think in that you know if you're painting pictures of ancient mythology um then does that does that depiction of ancient mythology include um, people of colour and LGBT people in some way or make explicit that you support those causes? Um, or are you making that kind of art to exclude those people? Um, so, you know, it, nothing exists in a political vacuum, really, does it? Um, and so, and also then we also have to take into account things like cultural appropriation, obviously. Um, so, um, you know, this is why I was really delighted when Nick Phillips asked me if I would like to take part in his Queering Deities series. Um, so I chose to be, uh, to represent Odin. Um, and I was really excited that he had um, the, the progress, progressive pride flag um, and also a Black Lives Matter um, uh, message on Odin's ship. So um, that was a really great process to be involved in um, and it kind of moves Odin beyond the kinds of views that some people might want to attribute to Odin, which is obviously bad. So uh, I mean, those views, the right wing views that people would want to attribute to Odin are clearly very bad. So that was a really exciting thing to be involved in. And, um, you know, like similarly, uh, Lydia Knox did her wonderful Angels of Covid series. And that has representation of people of colour and also of LGBT people in it. So, again, you can make these messages, you can include these messages in your art without necessarily um, beating people over the head with it kind of thing so um, which is something that some people might object to I don't know but there you go so um, like I said I'm a big fan of art but I'm not really uh, I don't really consider myself to be an artist I like drawing and I like making things um, but I'm not you know not hugely talented in the area um, but I thought I'd like to share with you um, a piece of art that I made uh, in a workshop, which I'm really, really happy with. Um, and I've actually tried making a similar piece of art again, and it didn't work as well. So, um, so this is my one piece of art that I'm like, I'm so proud of this, it's great. Um, so first of all, I'll tell you about the technique by which it was made, because you can try this at home if you like. Um, so the first thing you do is you get big piece of cartridge paper, um, quite thick cartridge paper and um, you, dunk, uh, you sketch out your design on it very lightly in pencil if you want and then, um, and then you drip wax onto your design. Um, and the purpose of the wax is that that piece, the, where the wax was, that pa the paper will remain white and that's the design. Um, so then you get a tub of water and you dip your cartridge paper, so it's got to be pretty solid sort of cartridge paper. Um, you dip your cartridge paper into the water until it's quite soggy. Um, and then you lay it out 
uh, on the floor, or I laid it out on the floor, or you can lay it out on a table, um, and then you can apply um, dilute poster paint to it. Uh, and what I decided to do was instead of applying the paint in a wash, you know, like from side to side, um, I decided to put my my uh, paper on the floor and drip the poster paint onto it. Um, and then once you've done that, you then wait for it to dry um, and hopefully it ends up flat. And I think you can kind of put it in something to make sure it ends up flat. So um, without further ado, I will show you the picture. Hopefully you can see that. Okay, okay. So you can see that the, um, the sorry, I'm trying to hold it straight and not get the reflection of the window in it. Um, <laughs> uh, so you can see the, the white bits are where I dripped the wax and then the blue and green is the drips of the, um, of the poster paint. And um, it actually represents um, a, the cup and ring marks that you see um, in Northumbria in England. Uh, which people pecked out with like antler or stone onto large rocks. So um, I'm very pleased with that. And you could also see it as like ripples in water if you wanted. Um, but that's that's my one piece of art that I'm really happy with. <laughs> so um, and you can see how it would be relatively simple to do something like that at home. Um, so one of the things I think is really interesting about making art is that you have like the perfect image in your head um, and then when you try to get it out onto paper um, then sometimes the perfect image in your head doesn't actually make it onto the paper um, and what I liked about that was I didn't necessarily have a perfect image in my head um, of, of the outcome um, so I kind of let go of that and then and did my process uh, and it came out really well so and I'm really really happy with the result so uh, that was you know sometimes you have to let go of those expectations and goals and just go with the process um, so I think that's good uh, and if you wanted to build in a sort of meditation process into your into the process of making your piece of art um, that would also be a good way to make it a, a magical piece of art. Um, I mean, because I was in a workshop making that, uh, it had a spiritual kind of component to it anyway. Um, and also it has the happy memory of the workshop, which I really enjoyed. So um, uh, that was a really good piece of art making process. Um, most of my other experiences of making art have been that I have a preconceived image in my head and then the piece of art doesn't turn out how I wanted it so that's um that's why I guess I don't consider myself to be an artist um but I am very pleased with that that picture that I made so um yeah and I think that art both the making of it and the viewing of it can be part of a magical practice uh, obviously, we have things like mandalas and yantras and um, other you know, sigils and designs. Um, think of the work of Laura Tempest Zakroff, for instance, who makes most beautiful sigils and art. Um, and so we can and we can build those into magical practice and we can do a process whilst making art as well. So I think that there's a lot of potential for building art into our magic and magic into our art um and so and perhaps you know like if you think back to the um our very ancient ancestors who were making the cave art which seems to have had a magical purpose um that of attracting game or perhaps placating the gods who provided the game um you know that art has always been a part of magical practice um and is a you know the idea of taking something a vision from in your head 
um, or something you've seen in the world and making a representation of it that may or may not be a literal representation of it um, is a very powerful thing to be able to do. So perhaps inherently magical, whether you do a some sort of meditation process or whatever uh, while you're making the art or not. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, art can be very, very powerful and transformative and um, and there should be more of it because and we should all have a go at making stuff even if you know even if we're not happy with the result um, the satisfaction of making something is a really satisfying thing to do um, for instance recently I took up making uh, doing crochet and um, I wouldn't consider myself to be an accomplished maker of things made with crochet either, but uh, it's something I really enjoy doing. Um, so this is a this is a mat that I made recently, which I was rather pleased with. Um, I think it's a it's a star with a lot of points, which I haven't counted. Anyway, there you go, cool mat. Um, so I enjoyed doing that; it was great. Uh, and um, again, no attachment to outcomes. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, so yeah, make stuff, enjoy it. It's all cool. And have a wonderful day.